dubbed the darling of the Tory party, Miriam Cates is on a mission to shape new government guidance on gender issues in schools. As a parent and a former teacher, Miriam is in a unique position to speak out on what she says are unknown consequences of children socially transitioning. Welcome, Miriam. I knew you were going to be a rising star when you first arrived in Westminster. So well done you, because you've, you're, you're championing some really excellent causes. This isn't your first time out on the campaign trail. So, but can you tell us, because um, the, the, the issue about children socially transitioning in school and using gender pronouns, and, and I was reading this morning about the fact that in Scotland, children can transition in school and parents don't have to be. Can you just, just give us a, a quick overview of what your position is and what you believe in and what you're trying to do? Yes, well, I think one of the first roles of, of government really is to keep the population safe, isn't it? And particularly to keep children safe in schools, which are, of course, you know, run by the government and during the school day are in the position of a parent. Uh, and I think over the past 10 to 15 years, this kind of idea that boys can become girls and girls can become boys and your sex is who you feel you are rather than a objective biolo biological reality has has crept into our schools at an alarming alarming speed and perhaps over the last year and a half we've become more aware of what's really going on in schools and the, the thousands of children who are mostly girls actually who are now uh, saying they're boys and the schools are, are going along with this and I think you know when you first think about this you can either think well that's not happening or another point of view is well what what's the harm but I think I think the, the reality is there is a lot of harm going on and you know at the end of the day we're either male or female nobody born in the wrong body nobody should be telling a child that they're born in the wrong body and which sex you are has you know huge consequences for the rest of your life and and i think this this idea that that teachers that schools are going along with this gender ideology that has no basis in fact it is not a pro an appropriate way to treat children uh, and we should be taking a long hard look at it and i'm pleased the government is coming up with some guidance on this but i'm not convinced it's in the right position uh, and i think it does need to be looked at again um, what, what's the issue about pronouns? What, what, is, what is it you're trying to achieve on pronouns? Well, I think some people seem to think that pronouns are really unimportant and it's silly to get hung up on the idea of pronouns and, you know, whether or not you should call a, a girl he if she wants that. And that really, uh, you know, this is reversible and it doesn't mean anything. But I think the exact opposite, because language is so important, because it's language that drives culture. And the whole point of language is that it has a shared meaning. And if you call somebody you know to be a female he... Every time you say that, you are pretending that that person is a boy or you're denying your own knowledge of reality. And particularly for children, that kind of compelled speech uh, is a very, um, it's, it's a psychological intervention and we just have no idea of the long-term harm of that, where children are being essentially told to lie by teachers uh, who are in a position of authority. So I think the pronouns are the key, actually. I think, of course, we should have single-sex toilets. Of course, we should reinforce single-sex sports. You know, that's a safe, that's an obvious safeguarding, uh, of obvious safeguarding importance. But I do think that these pronouns, you know, that are so natural, knowing whether someone is male or female is as natural to human beings as knowing up from down you know it's absolutely innate the biological sex binary is you know hundreds of millions of years old from an evolutionary perspective so the idea that a child or a teacher or anyone should have to call somebody by the wrong pronoun so to misidentify their sex every time they open their mouth is bizarre and i think if 15 years ago you'd said that whole classes of school children were being forced to do that i think we would have said that was pretty sinister and yet that is what's happening now and we know that you know, around 80 percent of schools have got children at least 80 percent children who are trans identified so this has become a phenomenon it's social contagion and a lot of other issues such as autism and trauma and things like that are, are, are being missed in this hunt for children with with a trans identity so justine and i came into parliament at the same time in 2005 and i think the one piece of advice we would both give you is that whatever words are said to you from any leader actually the only thing that matters it is what translates into actual policy whether it's guidance or it's it's a bill. What really matters is mm. what happens at the end of the day because people say a lot of things. I think Justine and I both realise they're not a time in a parliament and they are just words because they're very often words just to keep MPs on board at any particular time. So keep, you know, keep pushing for what you believe in, um, Miriam. And if parliament agrees with you, it will support you. But don't take the words of anybody as, as a, a 
green card that it's going to happen, you have to continue fighting. Justine, would you yeah. agree? Yeah, I mean, also, the other thing is, like, what's the money that goes behind any change? Because you could introduce guidelines, but if new updated guidelines, but if teachers haven't got the resources or the support to be able to put them into place, then it's going to be really hard for them to actually have impact on the ground. So it's about not just having policy, it's about having a proper game plan for how that is going to become the reality, as you just said. And Matthew, do you think that could be the point? I'll come back to Miriam in a moment. Do you think that could be the point? Because um, we brought it in 2020, the guidance in 2020 on um, PHSE and other guidance. Um, is it the case that we're expecting teachers to do something they're not actually trained to do, that they need stronger guidance and maybe even training to be able to, to deal with issues like this? I think so. I mean, I think it's really important that teachers do get involved in sex education because if they don't, then people are kind of, they don't know which direction they're going in. I think it is also important to point out that what, some of what Miriam is saying is really quite extreme. She's saying that no one is born into the wrong body. Now, of course, I understand biology. I understand that... Well, no child is. Yeah, but I, I, well, that's the same thing. I understand that a man is a man biologically and a woman is a woman biologically. That doesn't mean to say that some people don't feel very strongly that they've been born into the wrong body. We've had transgender people in this country for decades, well, for centuries, and only now is this backlash so extreme. I'm not someone who thinks that there are 100 genders. I'm not someone who thinks that parents should be excluded as a, mat as a matter of norm from what their children are being taught. But I am someone who thinks that protecting children's welfare should absolutely be at the heart of this. This is such a sensitive area. Miriam, did you hear what Matthew just said? I did, and I do find it quite surprising because no one is born in the wrong body. It's just a matter of fact. I mean, whose body were you born in? Some of the idea of being born in the wrong body or sex being assigned at, at birth is pure ideology. It's a total thought experiment. It's not based on any fact or science. And you know what? I'm. You're absolutely right that there have been people who have suffered from gender dysphoria, and in the past, that has been a fairly constant, very small section of the population, normally males, people who we would have used to call transsexual who often start living as, as females in their 30s and 40s. Now, that proportion of the population haven't gone away and they absolutely require, you know, the best of medical treatment and therapy. I don't think anyone would disagree with that. But what we're seeing now is not that at all. We're seeing an extraordinary phenomena of, of thousands and thousands of particularly girls uh, being told by the internet and reinforced by schools that normal uh, teenage angst, that other problems that require proper safeguarding and support are actually uh, proof that they're a boy. Uh, now that's indoctrination, you know, and, and we need to call it out. And I think if we're not clear about this, we're not going to get anywhere. And of course, we need sensitivity and training. But actually, what we need is boundaries. We need to say, as adults, no, girls can't be boys, boys can't be girls. If you're having difficulties, if you're having problems, we want to support you. But you don't support a child by telling them that they can change sex. And let's remember where this ends up. Because social transition is only a primary, you know, a first step. And we, we're seeing girls uh, injecting testosterone that they're buying illegally or uh, on the internet or being referred by doctors behind their parents back you know that is you know probably permanent infertility male pattern boldness uh, a deep voice for life you know we're seeing the rise of the detransitioners who are saying that they were not properly given treatment that they couldn't have consented to this so, you know we need to call this out for what it is and it, yes we can be kind but we also need firm boundaries so miriam we're going to have to enter there because this debate is going to go on and on and, and your campaign is too and um you know, good luck, 